And let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? And let me show my screen. Also, let me. Can you see my screen? All right, awesome. Let's put the chat in here. Let's have this. Like that. <clears throat> oh, is this recording? Uh, your screen share, blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's recording, right? Oh, we're going to. There we go. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, so let's see. We, um, I believe we still have a couple more assignments before the end of the semester. Um, uh, let's see, so assignment uh, seven is still um, uh, ongoing, which is the Node.js assignment. Uh, we, uh, we just covered Node.js. And the uh, the intent of uh, Node.js, as we dis discuss, is uh, to give you an alternative way of implementing a middle tier application. Right? More or less, what we did with Java, uh, we're gonna we're learning how to do it with Node.js. Let's see. There's a question in the chat. Um, is there any expectation for the parts? Is there any expectations for parts of the project to be done by Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about the demos uh, real quick. So the the uh, the, the demos are um, a little bit open ended uh, in that sense that uh, once once you do a um, um, you know the, as, there's going to be a couple of demos right that you're going to go out to the to the uh, TA and they're very open ended they're very laid laid back um, it's uh, it's mostly to for for yourself to measure your pace of progress, right? The, the intent is uh, the first time you, you demo the, uh, the application is to make sure that uh, they, you, you understand all the requirements that uh, they're, they're no, we wanna minimize any, um, uh, any surprises towards the end of the semester, making sure that you says, oh, well, I didn't understand the, 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 uh, the requirements to say, to mean this or that. And so you get a chance to discuss this with the OTA and, you know, and catch this a little bit as early as you can on a misunderstanding with the, uh, with the requirements. Uh, so, so the, the, the first demo is, is mostly to, you know, make sure that you, you're implementing something and to try and catch uh, any misunderstanding of the, of the requirements. It's also to, uh, to give yourself a, um, uh, somewhat of a goal or milestone uh, that uh, you're going to accomplish something for the next demo, right? So, so that uh, during during that first or second demo, you when, that you meet with your TA, so you can say, okay, well, you know, this is how, as far as I got, and you know, I will commit, uh, or I'll make a commitment. Uh, you, I mean, your team will make a commitment that for the next demo, you know, I'll have so and so features done. And um, it, and again, it's mostly you setting up your own expectations on what is it that you're going to deliver for the for the next demo, and and uh, and, it, and it's fine that you don't you don't achieve exactly what it is that you that you uh, set yourself uh, up for. Uh, obviously, you should not be uh, totally unrealistic and say, "Oh, I'll have everything done by next demo," right? So obviously, don't don't set up yourself for failure. Uh, make sure that you're you're realistic and and that um, you know you give yourself a uh, a realistic goal to achieve within a week or so of the next demo, and and, and if you if you actually you know turned out that uh, you focus your efforts on something completely different, as long as you can you can demonstrate that there has been progress from one demo to the next demo, 
uh, you know, you should, you should be fine. It is, uh, it is not intended to be punitive in any, in any way. Uh, we, and most of you, I don't, I don't foresee anyone having any issues and I fully intend for everyone to have you know, full credit on, on these um, P1, P2, P3 assignments. The, um, you know, we, we, we do want to catch uh, the very few that might be struggling and perhaps are falling behind or some, some folks have not even started on their project, right? And so we definitely, most of you have, most of you have are well in your way to successfully completing your project, but there's always a few that uh, you know, are stragglers and we wanna uh, identify them and offer them support. And um, you know, wherever we can, we will step in and try to help you. Uh, again, we're all here to, uh, to make this a success. Uh, let me see, there's a question, team members have, uh, team members have different. Uh, yeah, no. The the um, uh, the meeting should be per team, right? So a team meets with a TA, not team members with different TAs. So so it should be the whole team of three or four students meeting with one TA. So it's not like a separate thing between the different uh, different students meeting with different TAs. Uh, isn't next Monday, April 12th care day? Oh, yes, I believe so. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, everything, the, the only thing that cannot happen on anything that cannot happen, the only thing that cannot happen on care day is lecture. And, uh, oh, you know, I, I, there's nothing that I can force you to do <laughs> on, on care day, but, uh, but, um, uh, you know, we can we could keep working on things offline and uh, asynchronously, and so and, and yes, there will be a spread different spreadsheets per for each uh, different P P one P two P three for you to register yourselves and and uh, meet up with the uh, with the TAs and schedule something with the with the TAs. Um, yeah, so yeah, the 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 only thing about April twelfth is that there will be no lecture on April twelfth. But things can keep happening offline and, and asynchronously. Yeah, well, TAs, is not, TAs are not going to reach out to you uh, as, as in there will be a, an announcement of the TAs of providing a spreadsheet for everybody to register. And that should be happening as far as I understand it. Uh, let me circle back with the TAs, but that, uh, that should be happening. Uh, there should be a spreadsheet with folks can uh, register. Uh, teams register with a TA, not individually. Uh, yeah, you can you can select the TA randomly. You don't you don't you can choose. So, so a team can choose to meet with whatever TA they prefer. Uh, so so yeah, anybody can meet. Any, any team can meet with any TA. Uh, it's uh, it'd be mostly. And what uh, what slots are available? What what schedule where everybody can be at the same time and meet uh, with the TA uh, together as a team? Okay, uh, let's see. Right. So the the um, for the uh, for the REST application, so the, the, there was no requirement for the REST application to uh, be deployed on Heroku, and uh, the uh, and and also there was no requirement for the database uh, to also not, not to not be deployed on on Heroku. Uh, but my intent is that you know at some point we do need to deploy that to Heroku. And uh, and so what I'm what I'm uh, suggesting is that everybody should uh, should shoot for April 12th uh, to have everything working on Heroku. Well, everything the Java and the database uh, running on Heroku, right? We we just we discussed this uh, last week on on how to set up a database remotely on Heroku, and so you should be shooting for 
Wednesday, April 12th, next, uh, next week, or oh, April 12th, April 12th, what day is April 12th? Is it Monday? Wait. Oh, April 12th is Monday. Oops, sorry. This is supposed to be Monday. Okay, no, I think I meant to for this to be uh, yeah, April 12th, that's Monday. Yeah, Monday. April 12th. Um, yeah, so by, by Monday, April 12th, the intention is that for you to have both the Java running on Heroku, which most of you already have that or, or had that already, but also have the, the, uh, the MySQL running on Heroku. And I see that a lot of you have started that and, um, and some of you are having success, some of you are having some more uh, challenges and please reach out to me if it's not working for you remotely. And, uh, and so my, by, by this uh, next Monday, you should have your both the Java running on Heroku and also the database running on Heroku. Also, Node.js, again, for A7, the one you're working right now, there is no requirement for Node.js to be running remotely on Heroku. Uh, but the intention is that by, you know, by whenever you have uh, no SQL running, right, you should have, you should, you should have the, uh, both the Node.js and Mongo running on a remote database, right? Uh, but for the assignment by these due dates, right? It's okay if they're not running uh, in a, in Heroku. It's okay if they're all running just locally in a local database. Uh, but you know, by by um, by week later, right? You should have everything deployed uh, on Heroku. So as long as you deploy, you you provide a GitHub repository for the TAs. It, what, the, what the TAs are going to do is that they're going to clone down your projects and run them locally on their machines. Okay. Um, okay. So, so yeah, so we, we spent um, a couple of weeks talking about Java, right. And creating our own restful web APIs. And then we spent another week or so uh, talking about hooking that up, hooking your Java, RESTful APIs, hooking it up to a relational database uh, using um, MySQL and, and JPA and the and ORMs. So we're going to try to replicate that same functionality, but uh, using Node.js as the middle tier that would would replace or plays the same role as Java. Uh, and uh, we're going to now today and for the rest of the week, we're going to be talking about uh, how is it that we would store the database data permanently in a non-relational database? And we're going to be demonstrating that with uh, Mongo, MongoDB. Uh, let's see, is a question in the chat? Yes, uh, please shoot for next Monday to have your Heroku uh, Java application fully running on, on Heroku. Right, uh, it, the right now you have your Java and your Ma, and your MySQL running locally in your machine. Uh, by by the uh, a week from today, a week from today, it should fully be running remotely on uh, on Heroku. Okay. Yeah, no, the, the requirements are that at some point, all of this needs to be running remotely, right? Uh, that uh, this should not just be running locally, uh, but at some, at, at some point we're giving you some time because we know that setting these up, these environments remotely are, is challenging. And, um, and again, if, you run, if you're running into issues, the TAs and myself can help you set up the environment and configure it so that this is fully running remotely. So at, by the end, Hopefully by the end of the semester, right, you will have everything running remotely, right? Your Java, your database, all your databases. Uh, but I know, I know it's it's a uh, it's a uh, challenging. Uh, so we're giving you time uh, to uh, to to deal with these uh, environmental issues, on so that at some point all this is running remotely on on Heroku. Okay. Uh, question: uh, Do we have to worry about uh, overriding previous? Uh, yeah, you shouldn't worry about. 
the uh, anything being graded or anything like that, the TAs will always, always clone your projects down and and uh, and grade everything locally on your on their machines. Also, uh, the um, you know that's why we use uh, Git repositories, and you are providing Git repository access to the TAs. The TAs can replicate your your assignment. Um, you know, using the repository, they can they can certainly clone down and check out any any particular uh, commit, right? So they can go back to wherever you were and replicate your environment fully. So you should never be worried about you know deploying something and overriding something before the TA is uh, graded. So so please please always uh, you know keep keep your uh, Heroku's up to date and um, yeah and don't 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 wait for the TAs to to grade it. Okay. Let's. Um, so yeah. So let's. Let's. Uh, so last last week we uh, we finished up uh, the topic of using Node.js uh, to implement a middle tier application, and we use the assignment as a, as an example on what you might be able to do. Well, we we implemented. Um, uh, you know, we started looking at implementing uh, a quiz uh, handling application, right, where you could render different types of uh, of quizzes and then um and then the t uh, and then the, the, the students could navigate to those quizzes see the list of uh, questions instead of those quizzes and then then try to answer them and um and grade them local in their machine okay so for this up uh, uh, so for the next topic right we're going to be talking about uh, non-relational databases you know how we might store all this data permanently in a non-relational database. And we're gonna be using uh, MongoDB uh, for, uh, to do this, okay? So yeah, so the, the topic for the next week or two, uh, will be MongoDB, all right? Okay, let's see. So let's see, um, yeah, so week 12. There we go. Uh, let's talk about MongoDB. All right, let's see. Let's make this a little bigger. There you go. All right, so uh, so let's talk about um, MongoDB. So MongoDB is um, is one of several databases that um, that fall under the broad umbrella that we refer to as non-relational databases, right? And when we when we say when we say relational databases, right, is it's the it's you know the an example of relational databases is MySQL. MySQL is a relational database. And by relational, we mean that uh, data is 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 uh, implemented as a decomposition of multiple tables, right? We have a, a whole bunch of tables, and each one is storing multiple records, and um, and the records are are somehow related to each other, right? That that uh, we say that you know these topics are related to these widgets, or, or somehow. Uh, there's a relationship between records that are stored in a table and, and they're somehow related to some other uh, records that are stored in a different table. And the way we implement that is through foreign keys and primary keys, right? And so that that uh, fundamental fact of, of records relating to each other somehow, right, with uh, where you have fields in one of the records referring to fields in another record, right? That relationship is what gives the name relational databases, okay? That, that uh, you have these records and they relate to each other and we split it up into multiple tables and then we, but we, we establish the relationship uh, by pointing to each other. This is, the, this is in dark contrast on how we, we um, structure data in, in other, uh, in other uh, languages or techniques, right? For instance, in object orientation, the way we establish relationships between uh, between objects is that we we use um, uh, a, we use either collections like arrays, right? 
Uh, or we, we could use um, uh, memory memory references, right? Where you might have uh, you know objects that are stored in a different memory space are pointed to by objects living in another memory space, right? In in the same RAM, right? Um, uh, so so either either we have objects that are embedded embedded inside of each other. Right, or that uh, parent objects might have arrays of references pointing to uh, to other objects that they might be related to, and um, so so the way we think about the structure uh, of the data in object orientation is very very different from the way we store it in relational databases. Okay, um, we will also see that uh, in non-relational databases such as Mongo or Cassandra or Firebase. Right, uh, we see that um, we, we we increasingly use uh, JSON as a preferred way of um, formatting that data. Right, and and in JSON, you know, you can think of it as an object. Right, that uh, that it has a string representation of that object, and and that object uh, would would contain perhaps objects that contain other objects that are embedded inside of other objects that contain maybe arrays of objects of arrays of arrays of objects of objects. So, so a fairly, you know, arbitrarily complex data that is structured inside of each other, as opposed to split it up into multiple objects that are referring to each other, right? That are related to each other uh, by these pointing, uh, pointing um, variables to each other, okay? So non-relational databases, uh, fundamentally is different on how we structure the data, right? you know, how we think about uh, data that contains other data or that's related to other data. Uh, and you know, very much like XML documents where you might have you know, hierarchies of objects containing other objects, right? is, which is fundamentally different on how we uh, structure the data in relational databases where we, instead of be being embedded with each other, they're split into different tables and then they relate to each other. So, so yeah, so there's a, there's a plethora of other databases that do not structure the data using relationships. Okay? And we're gonna be looking at one of them called MongoDB. Now, the, this, uh, this idea of having non-relational databases is not, is not a new uh, idea. Uh, it's that uh, relational databases such as MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, Right, Postgres. These are all relational databases that you know have the the idea of relational databases has been, has been around for so long, and it has been so dominant uh, in the industry. Right, that uh, that's you know when if you study if you take a, a database course, most most of it you know ninety percent of it will be discussing relational databases, right? Because it's so it's such a dominant way of of uh, implementing uh, permanent data storage in industry for so long. And now today there's a, there has been a plethora of new problems in industry that uh, relational databases doesn't doesn't really play well with these uh, new uh, new new problems, right? And and so there has been a, a many different other types of solutions that have been growing, right? That have been uh, more applicable to the to the problems of today, right? Uh, one of the problems of today is that um, we are a, we are generating a huge amount of unstructured data, right? You know, every time we pick up a phone and we jiggle it around, we are creating a, a stream of data, right? That it's being stored somewhere on somebody's server or on somebody's databases, right? And, and for the most part, that data is perhaps fairly unstructured and uh, we don't know how that data is related to other pieces of data or uh, folks you know, in, the, uh, in pri private companies are trying to identify how a, this particular stream of data is, is related to some other stream of data, right? And, and there's no, oftentimes there's no clear relationship and we're trying to discover that those relationships by using you know, artificial intelligence algorithms and data mining uh, that uh, that uh, that we throw these algorithms at these huge piles of data, trying to identify you know what my preferences are and, and try to put a 
a, an advertisement in front of my eyes, right, for me to buy something, right? Uh, and and uh, and and so so this this is a complete different challenge, a di different type of problem from what typically relational databases have been used for, right? Uh, the, the you know relational databases are very good if you if your data is very well structured and you know what the relationships are, and and the the, the that structure or that schema doesn't change very often. You know, it's fairly stable over time, whereas non-relational databases plays nice with unstructured data with where you don't yet know what the structure of the data might be and you need to add new fields, remove fields, change data types, uh, and, and adapt fairly quickly at the changes in requirements. Uh, so yeah, so it's a complete different set of uh, problems and requirements. Uh, so so there's, there's plenty of uh, other have databases that uh, deal with all sorts of other issues, such as you know, real-time databases, graph databases, and whatnot. So anyway, so we're going to be looking at just one of these databases. It's MongoDB, uh, but you know, I certainly encourage you to take a look at uh, some some other uh, databases like Cassandra, CouchDB, Firebase. You know, certainly these are other non-relational databases that um, that really merit your attention. So um, yeah, so we're going to be spending the next couple of weeks discussing uh, MongoDB. Uh, so first of all, we'll ask you to install MongoDB. You'll you'll go to if you go if you head over to um, if you search for and uh, download download MongoDB community. Oh yeah. Right here, huh? What the <laughs> download community server? There we go. No, that's my SQL. Sorry. Download Mongo B community. There we go. There we go. So, so if you come here, and you can download the community server, and when you download it, you can then unzip it. Okay, and install it locally on your machine for whatever operating system uh, you want to download it for. And um, uh, now me uh, running here on Mac OS on, or, or on Windows, uh, I, I put it, it's a, a very common place to put it is uh, user local. So under user local, you can download um, Mongo. And I put it here under user local MongoDB. And under there, there is a bin directory. And this bin directory, this bin directory comes up, comes with uh, just a few, a few tools, Mongo and MongoD. So, so it used to come with a whole bunch of other tools like this one, dump and import and export, right? All these, but they, they have uh, now, what Mongo has done is that has split these into two different executables or installers. The, the Mongo community server only contains these two, Mongo and MongoD. One is the server. MongoD is the server, whereas Mongo is the client. Now, if you remember when we worked with MySQL, right, there was the actual server, the database server, and there was a client, which was Workbench. Okay, so here uh, you have something similar. You have MongoD is your server for the daemon, Mongo, uh, Mongo daemon. That's the server. Uh, and then you have the client, which is just Mongo, right? Uh, so you need both of them. You need to first start the server and then you use Mongo to connect to the server. Uh, so if you install Mo just Mongo, you'll only get these two. So for, for the other ones, for all the other ones, which we're not gonna be using, but they're useful. All these others are a whole bunch of tools for importing and exporting and doing all sorts, sorts of really cool stuff. Uh, you can download them from the tools here. If you go to tools and there is the database tools, you, you can download it. And what I did, I, I just copied all those tools back into the bin directory uh, so that uh, I could use them from the command line. Uh, you'll need to put this bin directory in your class, in your path. Now on Mac, 
uh, on a Mac, that's done in your uh, uh, Bash profile. Let me see, Bash. Bash profile, where's my Bash profile? Oh, there it is. Uh, name. Uh, where is my, is Bash session? Where's my bash profile? Uh, bash, there it is, my bash profile. So, so in this uh, bash profile, you can export. You can um, at the end of the uh, at the at the bottom of your, uh, you can export your location of your Mongo, your your bin directory. Uh, and then this makes your all the tools as part of your command line. Okay, uh, on a on a PC, what I did to install these in the, on a PC, I put it under Program Files, uh, the Mongo installation, and there's a bin directory in there. I put that bin directory inside of my uh, environment variables. Okay, uh, and those who know PC, I'm sure you will know how to do that. Put put your bin directory as part of your path. And then all your commands under there are available. Uh, okay, so so um, we're going to demo how is it that we are going to interact with Mongo. Okay, uh, so so yeah, here's just a couple of uh, steps on how is it that you would install it uh, using either Mac OS or Windows. Uh, so now. To, to use Mongo, we, we need a directory for the database to store all your data, right? And there's a couple of ways, there's a couple of, of op options, right? Uh, one option is to create a directory off of your root directory. And, and then under there, uh, put a DB directory. So this is, the, this is the default location where Mongo, the Mongo database is gonna look for Right when it starts up, it's going to look for this directory. If you can't find this directory, right by default, it'll it'll crash. Right, it'll quit. Yeah, so the server is expecting this data, this directory, and uh, and and if you know how to create it, then go ahead. Right, uh, the the problem is that what I have found is that um, most people don't know how to use the root account or their administrative administrative uh, credentials and so so if you know how to create a, a directory off of your root then that's fine go ahead uh, but um, you know I know I know that uh, maybe in the latest version of Mac OS uh, now it's uh, discouraged that you create directories off of the root and so I'm not I'm not requiring this anymore. Uh, so yeah, if you don't know how to do it, then I'm not going to ask you to do it. <laughs> instead, instead, what we're, instead what we're going to ask you to do is to create your own directory somewhere else other than the 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 root of your uh, of your operating system, right? And and once you create that directory, you can tell Mongo MongoD that's the server what directory to use. You can say d dash dash db path and and then tell it to use that directory instead. That makes sense? Uh, okay, so, so that's what we're going that, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna go and uh, we had already created a, um, a directory where we were doing our work. Okay, in particular, let's, uh, let's see, um, let's go uh, and you. And, um, and we had, um, Let's see, we, we had a uh, 2021 and spring and CS5610. Uh, let's see, where are we? Five, six, ten. And, and let's see. Um, I guess I guess this is not where I put it. I think it was web dev. I guess web web dev. Twenty one. 
2021. Spring. Oh, three. I don't know why I said oh three. And let's see. Um, I don't have the node server here, uh, but we can clone that real quick. I did share the the node server with everyone. Sign in. And let's go to repositories and let's clone down the node server that we've been working with. And I believe it's uh, this one for section one. Let me copy that and clone that down. Git clone. There we go. And let's open it up. So if we go in there, so web dev a one and then node uh, server node. There we go. Okay, so this is the this is the same node server that we were working up to this point. Uh, so what we're going to do instead of creating a directory off of the root, we're going to create a directory right here okay, in the same project. And then when we start off the server, the database server, we're going to tell it to use this, this directory instead. So we we'll say make directory data. All right, so now we have a data directory, there it is. And we're gonna kick off the server and tell it to store our, all, all our data under data, right? So we're gonna do mongod and then dash dash db path, okay? You know, using, using this here. Uh, space the name of the database the the name of the directory. Okay, so this is going to look up the that directory. It finds it, it finds it, and it starts up the server. Now, you know it's running if it says that it's listening at port twenty seven thousand something something seventeen. Uh, I think this is a little bit too big, and I can't find uh, the uh, the the port number. Oh, there it is listening at port, port 27,017, there it is, see that? Okay, this tells us that the database is running. Uh, now, you can install this database to be running all the time in, um, in, uh, uh, as a service, and you can do that. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you to do that since, uh, since you know, we're only gonna be using this database for one assignment for the next assignment or so. And so, so you don't really need for this to be running all the time. When you, whenever you need to run it, you can run it here from the command line and it's up and running, okay? So there it is. So we're gonna leave this alone now, right? The server can stay up and running. You can leave that alone. And so in a different, in a different terminal, right? We're gonna, we're gonna kick off the, uh, the client, okay? And we kick off the client by saying Mongo, okay, Mongo. And that starts our server, right? Now, if the, ser if the server was not running, Mongo would fail, right? And then kick you back into the terminal window. But because it was able to connect, right? Uh, then, then it's fine, it's up and running, okay? Um, all right, okay. So let's, let's uh, discuss how to use uh, Mongo. We'll, we'll first learn about some command, some uh, command line options, right? Following the, the slides. Uh, and then we'll we'll introduce the the assignment and see how we can use the uh, what we've learned to um, to complete the assignment. Okay, so one of the the simplest commands is that we want to be able to show the current databases, show DBs. Now this uh, this database, since it's running, you know, in a brand new directory, right? There's nothing in here, and and uh, and this is this is showing the the. Um, the default databases that are available, admin, config, and local. We can create our own database where we can do all our work, right, by using the command use. So use, uh, and then the database. So we're gonna, since we've been working with the whiteboard, right, we've been implementing the whiteboard application, right, from, um, you know, implementing the faculty's point of view and now implementing from the uh, students' point of view. Uh, so we can 
build a whiteboard. I'm going to give it a, a section. So whiteboard 01. All right. Now notice it says that it's switched over to whiteboard 01. And so if you say show DBs, you'll notice that the database is not showing even though it says that it's it's switched over to whiteboard 01. So it won't actually show the database. It won't actually create it until we store data in there, right? And so we haven't stored anything in there just yet, right? Uh, so so to store things into the data into the, the, the database, we need to store records into tables, right? But we don't call them records and we don't call them tables. So instead of records, like you would say if you're storing in a database, right? We don't say that we store records. We say we store documents, okay? And these documents are formatted uh, in JSON have, that have the, a JSON format, okay? So, uh, so we don't say record, right? We say documents. Also, we don't say tables. Instead, what we say is collections, right? So a collection is a is, is a is an array or is a collection of documents as when you say a table that has many rows we say collections have many documents okay now you can show you can list what the collections that you have so far by saying show collections and again there are no collections we are in the in the whiteboard database and there are no collections there just yet so let's let's insert a couple of documents into the into a collection right uh, so if you follow along here um we can we're gonna we're gonna play around with this with this um uh, domain here right with this uh database where it has a few things that are of interest we have a we have an inheritance relationship we have a one to many many to many Right, so there's there's quite a few things that we can play around with uh, implementing this in a in a non-relational database. So we'll start off by creating the whiteboard database. So all the commands that allow us to interact with the database, they all follow this syntax, right? They all start with db dot, so db. Then the name of the collection that we want to that we want to interact with, right? Like for instance, a collection might be a collection of users, a collection of courses, collections of sections, you know, the equivalent of tables, right? Uh, then the command, the command are the four different CRUD commands for creating data, for reading data, for updating data, or deleting data, right? And those commands are, these are the four basic commands. There's a whole bunch of other commands, but you can basically do pretty much everything with these four commands. Right, so so the syntax is db dot the name of your collection, followed by the command whether it's insert, update, delete, whatever, and then the data. Right, these could be this can be data, or it can also be parameters or configuration. Okay, so let's start off by inserting something really really simple. Let's insert. Let's create a new user. Okay, let's do that. So to insert a new user, you would say db dot users. Right, so we're gonna follow the same naming convention that we followed with uh, tables, right? These are gonna be plural nouns, right? With the difference that in um, that Mongo is case sensitive as opposed to uh, most relational databases are case insensitive. So whereas you would use uh, underscores to separate compound words here, because we have is case sensitive, we can use camel casing, right? Where we capitalize the first letter of each word. Here we have, we don't, users is not a compound words, right? So we just pluralize it, giving an S, right? It's all cap, all, all lowercase. So db.users, we're inserting, so insert. And these are all functions, right? Insert is a function, right? That's going to insert into the user's collection. And it inserts whatever we give it here to insert, right? And again, all the data is formatted as JSON objects, okay? Uh, so yeah, so here we can, we can provide the property value pairs, right? Property value comma, property value, blah, 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 right? So we can say uh, first name, 
first. And this might be Alice. And last might be Wonder. Um, well, I'll, actually, this is cap, capital A, right? Alice and then Wonderland. OK, close quote. We do an insert. Notice that it comes back saying that the insert was successful. It inserted one record. OK, let's insert another one. So let's uh, insert, oops. Let's uh, insert Ada, Lovelace. It may be Ada has a username, Ada. Okay. Notice one 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 um, one uh, quirky thing here is that is that Ada has a username but not Alice. Okay. Uh, and and this would be scandalous, right, in a relational database where you would expect that all records follow the same schema. Okay, and actually, this would be even more scandalous uh, if we call this maybe first name, and this would be Bob. So this would be Bob, and this might be last name, and this might be Bob Hope, and username is Bob. And notice, notice that uh, some records we've used first and some other records we've used first name with a capital N. And the database is just fine. It's not complaining. And, if, and that goes back to where I was mentioning earlier that these are unstructured pieces of information, that there's no schema describing what the structure of the data is. And it's, uh, you know, get, they, it gives you the max, maximum uh, flexibility of uh, you know inserting really basic whatever you want right unstructured data. Now, would you actually do this? Probably not, right? If you know what the structure of the data, you would try to stick to the um, uh, to a schema, right? That is that that you've all agreed in your project. Uh, so so basically, it leaves it up to you. Your, it's your responsibility to validate uh, whatever it is that you're storing in there. It is not the responsibility of the database. The database gives you the maximum flexibility, uh, but it, it doesn't mean that you're gonna go anar you know, all anarchy here, right? And, and each, each uh, document is gonna be different, right? It's, uh, but it's your responsibility to, to validate what it is that you're talking. It is not the, the responsibility of the database, right? So the database is not punitive. It will not punish you from and if you if you don't follow a particular schema, but it's, it is instead it's a good practice to to do follow a schema. It's just that it's not the database's responsibility. Uh, let me see. There's a question on the chat. Hi, professor. It said that it said that data is stored as key value in NoSQL list structure. Uh, yeah, key value. Right. Exactly. Uh, that that is indeed what we're doing in, in JSON, right? JSON is uh, key value pairs, right? So you have a key value, key value. Yep. Uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's continue. Yeah, so these are documents. And when you take a whole bunch of documents together, they make up a collection. Well, now if you go back and before, if you remember collections were showing nothing, now if we say show, collection, show collections, it says that indeed now we have at least one collection, our users collection, okay? Uh, now we can retrieve all the records, sorry, sorry, documents, right? We can retrieve the documents by using another command. Again, all commands start with DB. And then you say, what, what, um, a, on what collection are you applying this command? And so if you wanna retrieve things from the database, uh, you use the command find. Uh, so find is the equivalent of select. You know, just like insert is the same thing as insert. Well, find is the equivalent of a select statement where you are retrieving data from the database, right? If you say find, notice that it comes back with uh, the three documents that we recently inserted. 
right? This is kind of somewhat hard to read. So you could pretty print this, right? Make sure that you add some spaces and new lines and tabs uh, so that we can more, much more easily visually parse this. And you can do that by appending here a command called pretty. And now it's a little bit easier to read, right? Puts add you know, tabs and new lines and some white spaces, okay? And you'll notice that all the fields, all the key value pairs that we had used before are present there. Plus there's a, uh, a new field that we didn't explicitly add in there. And it's the underscore ID field. See that underscore ID. And, um, and also notice that the value is, looks like it's a, some kind of unique um, identifier. And, and so these, these fields, notice that they start with a, with a uh, underscore. And, and the reason they start with underscore is that this is a managed field. It's a field that is managed by the database. The database created this for us. Even though we did not ask for it, the database created it for us, right? And, and they play this, the role of the primary key that, that we had with the ID uh, field in our, in our relational database, right? If you remember, widgets had a field called ID. Okay, well, MongoDB creates its own, right? Whereas we were choosing the name of the field here, Mongo chooses for us the underscore ID field. Okay. It also makes sure that these fields are uniquely identified and also uses them to index the data, right? To improve performance of retrieving this data from the database. Okay. Um, you can, so you can retrieve, so find, find is the equivalent of saying select star from, you know, users, right? Where, are, where, where there is no where clause where you, can, you, you don't say where certain attributes are equal to whatever, right? You're not, here we're not providing any predicate. Uh, you can provide a predicate by saying that, that I don't want all the records, instead I want the records that meet a certain criteria. And that criteria is, is uh, implemented by providing a curly bracket where you can configure the criteria by which you wanna filter the records you want. So for instance, you might say where, right, the, the username, right, field is equal to say Bob, okay? So this is going to be like a pattern match and it's going to look for all the documents that have this pattern match. You say enter, notice that it returns that one um, document where the username matches the, um, matches what the, the, the text that we provide. Make sense? Uh, more commonly, you're gonna be retrieving records or documents by their primary key, right? If you have a list of documents, right? And those documents could be, again, modules, uh, lessons, right? Um, uh, topics, courses, right? The most common way that you were uh, retrieving this were the primary keys. Okay, so for instance, you might be able to retrieve, say, uh, Ada here if you know her her primary key. So we can just copy this and say, I want something that pattern matches this. So let's copy this, and so we can say db dot users right find, and then the criteria is that the key is underscore id is equal to the value. And notice that this value, it's an object ID, right? So you can't just use the string object ID, you need to put it inside of the data type object ID, right? So if you, if you do that, oops, I think I missed something. Um, oh, I forget to put the curly brackets. So curly brackets and then close the curly bracket. There we go. There we go, notice that it returns ADA. We can pretty print it so that it's easier to read. There we go. Okay, there we go. So we can use it, we can retrieve by a field, by a key or by their primary key, okay? 
you can uh, right, re retrieve by a, a non-key field as well. Uh, you can also specify that you want certain fields, but not others. Right? So for instance, here, by default, right, it retrieves all the keys. Right? Or you can specify which keys do you want. Right? So for instance, let's, let's go back to Bob Hope. Bob. So Bob is retrieving, it has all these four fields. You can specify that and that you that you only want, for instance, the first name. Well, actually, you can you can say I don't want the first name. So you can say minus one. All right. So notice that it returns um, it returns all the fields. Uh, wait, minus one. Oh, sorry, zero, zero. Uh, so notice that it returns all the fields minus the first name, right? It returns the underscore ID, the last thing, the username. Or you can say that you really only want the first name. If you give it a one, then it's only gonna return first name. Well, almost, check this out. So we do first name. Notice that it's returning the first name Notice that last name didn't come back, username didn't come back. There it is, just first name Bob. Plus, it provided us with the ID, even though we didn't specify that we wanted it. So it looks like ID doesn't really care whether you want it or not. It's always going to give you the underscore ID. Okay? Unless you explicitly say, yeah, you do not want it. All right? So if you say first name, I want the first name, meaning I don't want the other ones. And by the way, I really, really don't want the ID, right? Even though you wanted to give it to me anyway, I'm explicitly saying, please don't give me the underscore ID. I know you want to give it to me. I don't want it, okay? So that, in this case, we are only really retrieving just the first name of that document, okay? Uh, all right, excellent. So, so let's, let's now play around with, the, with the, this idea. Right, so let's uh, let's implement a, a couple of um, of objects that are you know based on the whole whiteboard online learning management system, blah blah blah, that we've been playing around all year, all semester, well, all year. And so let's uh, let's insert a couple of sections. So I'm going to just copy some of these some of this data. Let me insert these sections. Insert. Oops, and copy, paste. All right, see that dot, dot, dot here at the beginning? Okay, that, that is not the spreader <laughs> uh, operator, right? This is just saying that I, the, the command was split in new line, right? And so the, this next line down below just belongs to the line before, okay? So what are we inserting here? We're inserting in a section. Right, and the section is called 01, section 01. It has 12 seats and it's saying that it's somehow related to course CS101. Okay, that's fine, let's do enter. Okay, we have one section, let's insert just a few more. Let's insert uh, this one right here, there we go. Let's insert yet another, the third section here, section three. And finally, let's insert section four. Wait, was there an error? No. Paste it. There we go. We can list all the sections we have so far by saying db.sections.find. Pretty. And indeed, we have four sections, right? Section one, two, three, and four all with different seats, right? This is seats as 12 seats, 23 seats, 34 and 45. Okay. All right, so now that we got some uh, data in there, let's play around, right? We say, how about, how about if we wanna retrieve all the sections for a given course, right? So for instance, we might, we might do, we might do something like, you know, db.sections, and then find, right, and pretty, let's not forget, to make it look a little more presentable. And here we might say, well, give me all the sections whose 
course matches CS101. Okay, there it is. So it retrieves out of the four sections that we created earlier, it comes back with these two sections because we have the pattern match that they both have the key is equal to course and the value is CS101. Okay. Um, now we can be a little more specific, right? And say uh, we can combine, I, I wanted to just show you that we can combine this uh, key value pair with several key value pairs, right? And what we'll do is that it will combine them to do a pattern match, which documents match your criteria. Right, so we might say uh, not only course CS 101, but the number of seats is 12. And notice that now it doesn't return two core, uh, sections, but it returns only one, where both the seats matches the search criteria and the course also matches the name of the course. Both match. So this this here basically behaves pretty much like an and. Right. This is true, and that is true. Okay, so it's a, it's like an implicit, and we didn't explicitly say that we wanted to and these two things together. If we want to be specific, we need to use commands. Right, uh, we need to be able to embed operators inside of our filters. Right, to specify what kind of boolean expression we want to build. So all these operators, they all start with dollar sign, right? So for instance, here we have dollar sign GT, which stands for greater than. There's also dollar sign LT, you know, greater than means less than. And you can combine these operators to make arbitrarily complex uh, Boolean expressions, right? So for instance, let's run this first one. Okay, so if we read it, it says find those sections whose whose seats keyword or key uh, is greater than thirty. Notice the syntax, right? Notice that there's an opening curly bracket, right? That's that's the outer object that provides the outer container of our condition, and the condition is that seats is greater than thirty. All right, notice that everything is JSON, right? Uh, and uh, where everything's a key, so seats is a key, but dollar sign GT is not a key, right? It's an operator that is operating on a key, okay? Uh, so yeah, so this one says greater than 30. So we have 34 and 45, both of them are greater than 30. Uh, let's uh, go on to the next one. You can uh, you can explicitly use an and operator before before we, we this this, right, core CS, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, course CS 101 and seats 12. That's an Im implicit and operator. Right? I want this to be true and that to be true. Now we can be more uh, more deliberate, right? And be more explicit on what we want. We can say DB sections that find. And then here we can use the actual and operator, right? Dollar sign and. And what and does is that it allows you to combine individual um, predicates, you know, into much more powerful and bigger uh, Boolean expressions, right? So and and then an array of Boolean expressions. So they both have to be true for the whole thing to be true, right? And filter out only those documents that meet that criteria. So and is an array, and then say, you know, I want the I want the sections whose seats. So again, this is a curly bracket. Whose seats are greater than uh, greater than thirty, and all right. So this is my second predicate. And the seats are less than some value. And I forgot the curly bracket. This is a curly bracket here and a curly bracket there. 
screw them and there we go so 30 and 40. and there it is so we have one only one i guess we could pretty there's only one that has the seats greater than 30 which is 34 is greater than 30 and the seats less than 40 which is 34 is less than 40. so this is the only one that matches that particular criteria and that's what we get okay um you can also sort the data now sort is only for for display purposes it doesn't actually reshift the location of the of the documents instead is only for display purposes right so uh if we return all the yeah these are all the, the sections and right now it's in um uh, let's see it's in incrementing order of seats 12 23 34 45 so we can sort by seats forward or backwards. There we go. So this one is sorting by seats going down, right? 12, 23, 12, 23, 34, 45. Or we can say, I want to sort it backwards, minus one. So that now it's starting from, from above 45, 34, 12, 23, 12. See that? Uh, so yeah, so so very much. So you have um, sorting operators. Now this diagram here is trying to convey the the fact that you can string together multiple um, multiple commands, right? Multiple commands that are in line that can display the content much easier, right? So you know instead of you know instead of displaying like this, you can. You can also pass along to the next uh, viewer uh, formatter, right? That would make this look even prettier. So we can send that to pretty, so that first you sort it and then you prettify it. So now again, it becomes easier to read after been having been sorted. Okay. Uh, now these these operators that we've been using greater than, less than and or all those i mean there's there's a whole huge plethora of commands out there um i do encourage you to go through the mongo uh, documentation the docs and uh on the server so it has really really good documentation and i fully encourage you to be you know, feel Become familiar with what's there. You don't have to memorize anything, but nevertheless, you know you should be familiar where where things are and what can you find there, what, what you can't find there. Okay. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of commands like equal, not equal, in, greater than, greater than or equal, less than, less than or equal, not in. Right. So obviously, you know you should become familiar with those. There's also several operators for Boolean expressions. So not only did we see, a, I mean, we saw and obviously, uh, but there's or, there's not, there's nor, and you can combine them into ever more complex uh, query selectors. Uh, there's also aggregation. Again, you're not, be, you're not gonna be responsible for knowing all these, but nevertheless, I want you to be familiar that the same things you can do in relational databases, such as grouping, or limiting or pagination and things like that, right? Uh, you can do that as well here in MongoDB. All right, so we've talked about how to insert data, how to retrieve data. How about we're gonna be able to update data, right? So for instance, let's take a look at, let's take a look at one of these, uh, one of these sections, right? And let's, uh, let's, let's update this, let's say somebody, register for this section and we want to update the number of seats to 22. Uh, so let's do this. We can say db dot sections. We want to change a section. So we want to update a section. So update, there it is. So I'm going to update a section and I need to, so sections takes two arguments, right? The first argument, right? It's a JSON object that specifies the where clause, right? What is it that you, I want to modify? What document I want to modify? And then the second one tells me 
details about what those updates are, right? So first we have to identify that it is this, uh, this section that we wanna modify. We could do it, you know, right now, all these are, are, you know, the ID, the name, the seats are all unique. Although, you know, you can certainly have more than one section that has the same seat, but not the same name. So let's go with name, right? We're gonna say, I want to modify the section whose name is O2. What do I wanna do? Uh, well, let's see. So somebody just registered. So I'm going to decrement this 23 to 22. That makes sense, right? So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna update and say that seats is now, oh, uh, what is it? It was uh, 23. Uh, 23 seats. So somebody just registered. So I'm just going to say 22. There we go. Okay. All right. So it says that it was successful. Now let's look at it. Let's look at the change, right? Let's look at the change. And you'll notice that something went wrong. Something went terribly wrong. Okay. Let's see. Well, there's our uh, section four, uh, four, section three. Uh, section one, where's my section two? It's gone, right? It's gone, right? So what happened is that we unintentionally or intentionally, we replaced the old object and we replaced it with a brand new object that only had the seats. And that's not what our intention was. That was not our intention. Uh, instead, our intention was that we want to just update one single field, okay? Uh, so, so the way we would do that is say, say, say we want to modify this guy, right? With name where the name of the section is one. And uh, I'm not just going to update the C's. What I'm going to do right, is... You know, because we want to modify an individual field, instead we need to use the command set. Right, so the command set will do what we want it, right? And only modify, only modify that specific field in the database, right? And to the new value. So the new key to the new value. Let's do enter. Let's do update. And now I want to show them all. Let's see. Seats. Seats. Um, wait, what happened here? What did I do? Seats 22. Oh, yeah. Uh, 01, right? There's a 01. There it is. So 01, 01, we were able to change the seats to 22. There it is. See that? We did the update to 22. Uh, as opposed to replacing the whole object, you know, we were able to replace that one field, right? It's exactly what we did. Perfect. Uh, we can also remove records or documents, right? Using the remove command. So for instance, let's, um, let's um, remove this, this one here, right? Actually, let me, let me change that not to 23, but to 14 something. And the reason you'll see, right, what we what we want to be able to do is we want to remove this one right here because it's kind of bogus now, right? Uh, it doesn't have a name. It doesn't it doesn't have a course, right? It's kind of like a bogus record, right? So let's remove it. So to remove it, we can say db dot uh, sections dot remove, right, and then specify that we want the one whose seats is twenty two. Uh, which right now is unique, right? If it wasn't unique, we always could have used the object ID before removing it. So let's see if that works. Let's see if they're all there. There we go. So there were four records, and now there are only three, which is perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Okay. All right, excellent. Let's keep going. Now, there's a whole bunch of other commands that you're not going to be responsible for, but nevertheless, I'm gonna, just going to list them here. Uh, from the documentation, there's insert one, insert many, 
and there uh and and so we're we're spending more time in this insert so insert with insert you could do everything right all the other ones are syntactic sugar um, of this one uh what is this question on the chat uh all right uh yeah just uh, another few minutes uh there's also update right update also there's a few versions and, and uh there's update one update many um, the one we're going to spend be spending most of our time is this update, right? Again, all the owns are just syntactic sugar of that one. Let's see, there's a question in the chat. In other words, how early? I don't know. Wait, is there? Okay. Uh, deletes, same thing. There's a few different delete commands of which you're only responsible for this one. But nevertheless, I encourage you to read up on on these uh, commands and right and and um and become familiar with them uh but again you can you can basically do everything with those uh commands right um inheritance so inheritance we uh we we just like we mentioned in um in relational databases that uh, there are certain things that you can't do in relational databases that you can do in object-oriented technology but not in relational databases one of them being inheritance, right? In object orientation, it's very common that you have classes inheriting from others, okay? Uh, and you cannot do that in relational databases, right? Uh, you can you can fake it, right? And so so the same thing happens with non-relational databases, at least with Mongo. There's no such thing as inheritance, but what you can do instead, right? Uh, to to fake it is that for instance you might have multiple different types of users right maybe some users might be faculty other could be students right and the way could you can do that the way you can model that right is by is by doing you know keeping track of some field that establishes the type of user right or the type of object in this case uh, i'm using type equal faculty and I'm saying that maybe Ada is a faculty and maybe Bob is a student or whatever, right? And, and, then, and then depending on your type, you might have other fields that are, that are pertinent, right, to that type. Like for instance, a, a, a faculty might have an office, whereas a student might have a GPA, right? And, and then, you know, only a, uh, only a student will have a GPA and only a faculty can have an office, right? Uh, so for instance, we might update Ada. Let's look at Ada right now. So let's do db.users.find, pretty. And let's see, we have Ada there, right? And right now she's not a faculty. Let's make her a faculty. And which will, will give us an, a, a really nice, example of other things you could do with an update right so we say you know db dot users dot update i'm going to update ada uh and this is the update i'm going to make so the update is ada so that so that the username is ada there it is copy copy paste and we're going to set right we're going to set a new field called type and it will be faculty. Okay, we will say enter, and if we look at for look for the users. Notice that now Ada has a fields type. So the dollar sign set command can be used not only to modify existing values of existing keys, but it also allows you to add brand new fields that were not there, like this type. Okay, um, so so for instance, let's modify Ada again. And let's add another field. We can say that because she's a faculty, well, now she has an office, right? And the office might be, you know, 132A, right? And let's see, notice that now Ada has a 132. Uh, let's, uh, let's do Bob, let's make Bob a student. So we'll say, um, so this will be, the username is Bob. And the type is student. There we go. And let's uh, 
there we go. So now if we look for all the uh, find, notice that we have uh, Ada as a faculty, Bob is a student. Let's make uh, Alice also a faculty. So this will be faculty, faculty. Oops, uh, sorry. Type faculty uh, for Alice and Alice. We don't have a username for Alice, so let's use the first name. Oh, uh, that didn't work. And uh, oh, it's capital Alice, capital Alice. There we go. So if we look at all the users, we'll see that, that we have two faculties and one student. Uh, and now, now I can use it like any other field. I can say, you know, find me all the faculty. It will say that, uh, you know, whose type is faculty, right? And notice that it returns the two faculty or the students, right? Uh, so, so this is some, you know, kind of like a way of implementing um, inheritance. Okay, this obviously is not real inheritance. Uh, sometimes this type of inheritance, the way you document, the way that you implement it, is sometimes referred to as a denormalized inheritance, right? Where, it, you know, real inheritance, you would have, uh, you know, in Java, you would have multiple classes. And the way you would implement it in a relational database is you would implement it with multiple tables which you then need to join, right? But that implementation is very expensive because you have to, your joins are expensive. So uh, the more common way of implementing a relational database is that you have a single table and then you have multiple records of different types, but in the same table, right? And that's all generally referred to as, as denormalized inheritance, right? And so that, that technique is equally applicable here in non-relational databases. Okay. Um, all right. We'll do many to many when we meet again on Wednesday. We'll we'll talk about that uh, then. All right. Do need to drop. All right. Any questions? All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone.